Start in me. Let there be peace. And let it start in me.
Nice. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We are uh, streaming live today. Uh, Dan's finally, boy, he's worked out all the kinks. So suck it in, right? Okay, sorry. That's, that's just a personal pep talk. It was out loud. <laughs> but we're grateful to our tech team. Wonderful to have a great uh, praise team with us today. Um, it was going to be quite cold in here, and Jeff helped us out when the, uh, there was a little hiccup in the boiler this week. He got it running that very day. So uh, many thanks to many of you. Yes. Let's see. After worship, we've had a, a really nice study together in the Gospel of John. So you're welcome downstairs um, 10 or so minutes after we, we let out for worship. As we leave, the ushers will release people from the back first so that we don't have to congregate and share um, all the air together. But uh, anyway, just one of those cautions. Thank you for being involved in that first Sunday food offering as uh, together we're blessing the greater community. We're grateful that you uh, bring those in uh, month after month. Our third of three midweek Advent services will take place this week. We're sharing those with Hope and they're hosting. That's at 6.30 p.m. And it's about a 30-minute uh, service if you want to join us. We're asking folks to RSVP for our Christmas Eve service. And uh, rather than being shoulder to shoulder, we have two services, one at 5 and one at 7, and really good signups. But there's still 15 to 20 um, seats available at each service. So if you haven't RSVP'd, um, if you're going to speak to me today, write it down because I'll, I'll hear too many things and forget. But you can email Cheryl or me, or you can leave a message at the office. Let us know your name, a contact number, and how many will be in your party. We'd love for you to join us. And I think those are the, the announcements I have for you today. Um, last week in our message, we turned to Peter's second letter and found God's patient and renewing love. And that that love moves us to love him rightly. And we're unable to do so without his love coming to us. And he also grows and transforms us, even as he helps us connect others to that love. Today, we take a cue from John the Baptist to show them Jesus. And we do that with our words, with our gratitude, and with our lives that are settled and resting in his grace and mercy for us. So I look forward to sharing that with you. But would you stand with me now as we join in our invocation in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together.
You may be seated as we enter into a time of confession and then hear life-giving words in the divine service. It's God who serves his people with the forgiveness we need, with the reminder that he's done the work and re we receive the benefits he's earned in our place. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Jesus, forgive our sin condition. Uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pause now for some moments of silence uh, that we can each have some prayer and reflective time. of life for each of us this morning. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, to us all. Amen. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing together?
while you're standing, we'll take time to speak God's word to each other. And Don, you're welcome to come forward as you'll have the, the next two lessons read. Appreciate that. So we join in a portion of Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. When the Lord restores the fortunes of Zion, we will like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of Nate. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes without weeping bearing the seed of sorrow, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. Please be seated. Don, thank you for preparing for this. Appreciate it. The first reading is from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison, prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them beautiful headdresses instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My, show, my soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians, beginning at the 16th verse. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel today comes from the gospel of the Apostle John in the first chapter. We'll look at verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. We stand together in honor of the Holy Gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness 
about the light. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent uh, from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may remain standing as we will sing together, but a reminder on the offering, we're not passing the plate, so we don't share uh, germs that way. But uh, those gifts help us to join Jesus in connecting others to his love and to follow him as disciples. And there's a plate uh, near the exit as you leave this morning. Just my name. 
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Today, our sermon, Show Them Jesus. We take our cue from John the Baptist in the gospel today, but we'll look to all three readings, Paul's words to uh, the Thessalonians and to Isaiah, the prophet's words as well. The truth is, and this is our aim to focus on, lives that are settled and resting in the treasures of God's grace and God's mercy, those lives, our lives, point to our Savior King. So there's reason to lean into his mercy and his grace for each of us and that he's given us. Let's start with John's words, the apostles' uh, um, gospel in the first chapter. We read there, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he's speaking of John the Baptist. He came as a witness, in other words, to share with people what he knew of this promised one. He was, his whole purpose was to show them Jesus came as a witness, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him, that all might believe through Jesus, that God the Father was seeking out people to pour out his love and his forgiveness upon them. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. In the same gospel, John the Baptist speaks about himself, and he says, he, Jesus, must increase but I must decrease. And then he sounds just like our rescuer, savior, Jesus, when he says this, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John the Baptist's message is very exclusive, and so are the claims that Jesus has of his own. When Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life that you're looking for. And he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father but through me. And that's the scandal of exclusivity. And those who follow another way, who have a different faith system, that can be very off-putting. And how do we as his followers take a message that we do not and shall not water down, but share and show Jesus when those claims can really um, make people defensive about what they're aiming their life at? I like this quote that I found uh, this week because it sums up really what we know from the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is no way to work your way to God. God didn't set out principles, follow all these rules and you'll have my favor. You'll earn and deserve my love. Do all these things right and I'll owe you life. That's, that's not how it's spelled out in scripture. And DeYoung continues, there is no way to climb up to heaven. That is the, the image, really, of Advent and Christmas, that God would take on human flesh and come to us. Born in Bethlehem, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, knowing we could never gain the favor of God, God's going to do the work himself. And Jesus is born in Bethlehem, it seems the weakness of the rest of us. And yet he'll live that life we are unable to. And he'll take it to a cross and he'll rescue you and I with his life, with his very blood and walk from a tomb alive. There is only one way to be with the Father and that is through Christ. Scripture is clear on that. And that's exclusivity as many are seeking other ways that they might find God's favor. Had a conversation with a very good friend this week, and he didn't say these exact words, but this is what he was getting at. 
how do I share Jesus? How do I show others Jesus? How do I point to him when I don't want to come off in judgment, when I don't want to come across as condemning, especially those who are from another faith system? And we all have friends who um, are very religious. They're very good people. They're great for our communities. And yet they don't know Jesus and his forgiveness. So how do we give them Jesus? And I told him, I love your heart. That's where we all should start. Because you've probably had those conversations with others who say, you're on the wrong track. And what happens? Immediately the guard goes up. You're defensive. You're not going to hear another word that person says. In fact, you may start digging into how they're on the wrong path and their lives show it. So how do we share the joy that we have and the certainty of Jesus' claims? Not an easy task, but it can be done. One thing, we we certainly need to be praying for those people we love who are of a different faith system. And the the beautiful thing is, uh, I, I love this image that um, the God who brought his people Israel out of Egypt and parted the sea so they could walk on dry land, certainly he can open the heart of people we love who are far from him or trust in maybe principles to gain his favor that will never provide what they promise. He can open hearts, he can open minds, and he's always ahead of us In fact, my friend, God has, like each of us, been really searching after him and seeking him out for, I'd say, 11 years, but really his whole life. And God is patient and tenacious, and my friend knows the love of Jesus as his own today. And that's what he desires for others. And we will have opportunity to speak, and that's the witness of John to share with people, and and it's good to think through. If someone asks me, why do you trust in Jesus this way? To have a ready answer, right? Perhaps I've tried living as well as I could, and I fail all the time, but I have a Savior who daily forgives me and says that I am a child of God. He's placed his name upon me to share in our words and show them Jesus, yes, with our words, but to know that God is ahead of us, already seeking those hearts. I want to share a a passage. I may have to explain a few things as we go. This is from the book, and it is uh, fictional. It's called The Shack. It's written by William Young. And um, in the Christian community, there are some controversial parts. There's some theology that I don't buy into that, that kind of threads through it but the premise is the main character is a man named Mac and he has uh, lost his loving daughter very young to violence and uh, someone has killed her and he's dealing with hurt and anger and uh, father son and holy spirit invite him to a cabin in the woods where his um, daughter was murdered and uh, it's a dream or a vision, but he has a weekend in this cabin where God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, sit at the table over meals and and kid each other and share in community, and Max invited into the conversation. And in between meals, he'll, he'll go with one of them and they'll talk about, he's trying to put the pieces of his life back together. Let me share part of this. So Jesus is speaking to him. He says, remember... The people who know me are the ones who are free to live and love without any agenda. God, having restored his people, we're now freed up to love others. And Max says, is that what it means to be a Christian? It sounded kind of stupid as Max said it, but it was how he was trying to sum everything up in his mind. Who said anything about being a Christian? I'm not a Christian. The idea struck Mac as odd and unexpected, and he couldn't keep himself from grinning. No, I suppose you aren't. What this uh, part of the book is getting at, Christianity as um, um, a 
person who can be a cultural Christian. They identify that way, but they're not really a follower of Jesus. Or they have the philosophy of how a Christian should act, but again, they're not following Jesus as their Savior. They arrived at the door of the workshop. Again, Jesus stopped. Those who love me have come from every system that exists. They are Buddhists or Mormons, Baptists or Muslims. Some are Democrats, some Republicans, and many don't vote or are not part of any Sunday morning or religious institutions. I have followers who are murderers and many who were self-righteous. Some are bankers and bookies, Americans and Iraqis, Jews and Palestinians. I have no desire to make them Christian, again, philosophy, if you will. But I do want to join them in their transformation into sons and daughters of my Papa, right, that Abba Father, into my brothers and sisters, into my beloved. And then Mac puts into words what the reader is worried about. He, he says this, does that mean, said Mac, that all roads will lead to you? That everyone who tries hard is really serving the same God? Is that what you're saying, right? The answer, not at all. Jesus smiled as he reached for the door handle to the shop. Most roads don't lead anywhere. What it does mean is that I will travel any road to find you. God chased you down to make you his own child. And he does that in the lives of others who perhaps think they're on the right path and are not. And he'll bring them home. Our God is loving and he is ahead of us every step of the way. So to have that trust, people we pray for, that God, would you reach them? Would you open their hearts and their minds? This week, a little bit of car trouble. We always welcome that into our lives, right? Um, what was our New Testament? Pray in all circumstances. There's a test, right? Um, so you start asking friends, where do you take your car? And a good friend said, you know, we're kind of between mechanics. We haven't had the best experience recently. But my hairdresser, right? You trust a hairdresser, right? She's lived here her entire life, and she says, go to uh, Jim Sayre. We're about a mile away. And she said, and you can be the guinea pig. Maybe it's good, and we'll all go there. So that, that gives you confidence too, right? Um, but I met Bud there, looked at his website. They've been in business since 1972, and we don't advertise. And uh, he told me that. And he was happy to hear that this friend of his uh, referred us there. Um, he said it's all word of mouth. And they've been at it a long time. And that's true of our witness to Jesus as well. Our words, when we tell them what Jesus means in our lives and what he's done for us, helps connect people to Jesus. But how we live is equally as important. You see, when we, are, we rest in his goodness and not our own, when we're settled in his love for us, that's not how the world works. The world is spinning its wheels, trying to amount to something and to be worthy of God's love. And so we can rest in even the promises that we hear from Isaiah today. As we look at verse 1 of the text that Don shared, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Financially poor, yes, but the poor in spirit. And, and so... We don't have to bring our wealth of faith to him. God pours faith into us, forgives us, brings us his grace and his mercy. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And God has likely bound up your broken heart at times, perhaps trying to live the way you think he wants you to and you haven't been able to. Or the times there's been great difficulties in life, and he was there when no one else was. And he's given you liberty now to love him rightly and to love each other as we want to be loved. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And to be in our witness to speak about how I had this problem and God has taken that from me. And every day I rely on his 
care for me. That's part of our resting in and being settled in his love and his work for us. In verse 10 of that same part of Isaiah's word, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And that's the truth of your baptism as well. When God pours faith into you and he says, I will be your salvation. The righteousness you need to be in right standing with me, I will declare it upon you and it's yours. You can count on it and we can rest in that. Our hearts can be settled. We don't have to strive after these things, but receive them every day from his hand. This quote caught me as I prepared this week. God's grace through Christ is greater than our sin, even on our worst days. But the truth is, we need his grace on our best days as well. His grace is truer than our greatest acts on our best days. If every day from here out was our best day, we still could not undo our past. We could not remain in God's good grace. He pours it out in Jesus. It's ours as his children, and we rest in that, when we settle our lives in that, and when we can express it, fantastic. But even when we don't, people will see a difference. That person's not striving. They're not always anxious and worried about their eternity. And we'll probably hear, tell me more about that. And there's that opportunity to speak of Jesus. There was uh, someone uh, who, who called this week, connected with St. John, and uh, wanted to see their Facebook page, so went there, and the very first post from this person was uh, just a clear expression of their gratitude, their thankfulness to God for who he is in her life and what he has done in her life, kind of like what Isaiah was saying. It was just a bold A simple but clear statement that God is in my life and has done good things. Our gratitude as well points to Jesus when we put it out there in conversation and hopefully we'll um, learn to be upfront that way. I count on him every day and he comes through on Facebook that we would be clear that I follow a Lord who is gracious and kind and forgiving. In our New Testament lesson, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. A, it's good for you. It keeps us settled, right, and resting in his provision, even on hard days. Um, But it's good that others hear, because that's showing them Jesus. His will for us, our gratitude, our thankfulness to Jesus points others to him. We join John the Baptist. We desire that our lives would not be ones that condemn others, but that share good news, that God is still doing amazing, really uh, eternal life-altering things in the lives of others. We desire to show them Jesus living that settled life, resting in his goodness, with our voices telling others about it, all of that points to him, the one who has come to us, come down to us and given us himself. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we profess our faith today in the words of the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you for joining in that. You may be seated as we uh, bring the prayers of the church before God. peace, let us pray to the Lord. We pray for joy at all times and intelligent words and deeds that all may be recognized our Christian confidence in Christ's advent. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. We pray for the church that God would give us faithful stewards of his ministries and servants of Christ who are trustworthy to proclaim him alone as Lord and Judge, and that the Lord would tend his flock by his word and spirit, and that Christ's lambs may be gathered into God's arms and gently led to eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the children of our families, that every struggle would be lightened by your son's gracious visitations, that God would preserve them from dangers to body and soul. Guide them by his word in wise paths and keep him firm in the faith till life's end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our fellow citizens that God would preserve us from placing our trust in princes and mortal men who come and go like grasses before his breath. We pray for our nations that God would give rulers who would rule after his good pleasure, keeping order and proclaiming life, and for godly quietness and honesty. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we offer up to sick and sorrowing that the shepherd of Israel would give ear to their need. We pray for God's peace and comfort for the family of Geraldine. Sister Deb Mueller, who passed away on Monday. We pray for Ashlyn, a young girl, eight or nine, who's being treated for brain cancer. We pray for successful treatment for her, wisdom for the doctors, and that God would give her and her family his peace and strength. We pray for Carolyn Mendy, who to have full healing and restoration of her vision after eye surgery, and we pray for God's strength, effective medications and wisdom for the doctors treating Russell Redding, Charles Smith, and all others who face long-term health challenges. We also offer up Lord Marcia Simon, Mark Gardner, and all those battling cancer. We pray for continued healing and minimal adverse side effects from the treatments. God's peace and strength to all those fighting cancer and also their caregivers. We offer all these up for healing, courage, and perseverance to all who cry out to God, that they may find comfort in his enduring word and certain hope in the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we also offer up to Stephen Ministry and the caregivers and the care receivers in that 
in that uh, ministry. And Lord, we offer up our country and its leaders. We pray for our active duty military and their families. We pray for all our police officers, first responders, and firefighters. We pray for our veterans, the unemployed, and those who are homeless and in prison, and in hospitals, those dealing with grief, and those dealing with long-term health challenges. And we pray for those who are fighting for for addiction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also offer up our homebound and those that are in nursing homes and assisted living centers that cannot be here with us today. We especially pray for Yvonne, Sally, Shirley, Edda Marlene, Maxine, Tally, and Rose. Lord, into your hands we command all for whom we pray Trusting your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mark, thanks for raising those prayers on our behalf. We stand together now as we join in the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We remain standing as the priest team comes forward and we'll share uh, a, a fitting uh, way to go out with the, uh, the hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain, as we show them Jesus. <laughs> 